All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We've got Mr. Master Anthony here. How are you? Good. We're doing good today. All right, How are welcome. you doing? Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you sound like a professional already. Is this your first podcast I'm hearing? Inaugural one. Yeah. Big yeah. One. Inaugural. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I feel privileged. Thank you, you so much. Yeah. First guest. The one. It, don't look at it as an experiment. This is real. This is a real deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the experiment. I'm I'm ready for you guys. All what right. Do we got? Well, well, we got a lot of we got some really cool topics today. So first of all, why don't we just get you introduced who who you are, what you do, and okay, and um, then we'll uh, talk about some interesting stuff that you do. All right. My name is Anthony Kuntz. I own Martial Arts Advantage, and I have a passion for martial arts and self development. Um, anything from physical to cognitive. Dealing with the martial arts physicality. Wow. And you just don't do martial arts. You're also a certified weapon trainer. Yes. So I would, you know, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. I would consider all of it martial arts. If hmm. it's punching, if it's kicking, if it's rolling around acrobatically on the ground. Wow. Grappling. Jitsu, grappling. <laughs> oh, look at you. Um, firearms, nunchucks, ninja stars. So it's self-defense in, in, in <clears throat> essence. You know, a lot of it could be used as self-defense. I just think of it as self-development in so many ways. Hmm. And and how so? So I know the premise of what you started. So why did you start what you started? So tell us about yourself, like how you got into this and, and your and your background and your training. So you want to hear the whole story? Go from yeah, the beginning. Let's do it. Yeah. So my father, <laughs> uh, military, he was in the Air Force. And back then, he took me to a movie when I guess, I, I thought I was older, but now I hear him tell the story. I was around three years old, three and a half years old. Was it rated R? It was. <laughs> and I don't know if they, they didn't do the ratings like they do nowadays. And oh. I think with parents, they weren't um, as, as sure of themselves as far as understanding what the ratings actually meant. It was just a movie. So he took me to a Bruce Lee movie. We lived in Turkey overseas. Wow. And <clears throat> I came home and he said immediately after the Bruce Lee movie, I think it was Enter the Dragon, I came home and I started using some karate moves on the furniture and I chopped a lamp. It fell over. My dad, he nice. had the insight. He says, you know what? We need to get you into some martial arts classes. Wow. So immediately immersed me into martial arts classes. And then depending on which country we lived in at the time, that was the martial art I studied. Wow. So you're really just world trained. <clears throat> like, I, I've, I've traveled quite a bit um, in, uh, with my father. He moved, you know how the military is, deployments every three to four years. Mm -hmm. He either moved to Japan, he moved to Korea. We were in the Philippines, um, over in Europe, um, in Turkey, as I said, and back to the States, back and forth. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just depending. When I was growing up, it, it, it was all related to the movies, and the martial art you did back then was according to what was popular. Mm. So Bruce Lee was popular <clears throat> back then. He was the catalyst of so many people that got involved in martial arts. And he, I don't know if you know a lot about Bruce Lee. He was a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. He, you? Nothing. She knows none. You know who Bruce Lee is? Semi. Semi. Okay. <laughs> so he is, people think of him as this prolific Chinese movie actor. And he came overseas and he started doing these movies. Celebrity. He's more than that, though. He was a philosopher and he was... He had an understanding probably decades uh, uh, before his time. He understood ranges of martial arts. He understood that not one martial art was the best as far as, let's call it self-defense or self-protection. He understood you needed a variety of martial arts and depending on your body type, what was better for you hmm. and depending what your passions were. And he understood ranges like nobody else. Now with the advent of the sporting event, have you heard of the Ultimate Fighter Championship yes. UFC, yeah. super popular now. Mixed martial arts, way before then, because mixed martial arts now it's 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 irrefutable that you definitely need a variety of martial arts from standing up to being on the ground. And Bruce Lee had that insight way back in the seventies, in the sixties. Hmm. Wow! And he was apparently the what the founder. Like, is the, is, did he kickstart martial arts back then? You know, there there were several uh, people that did martial arts that were great. I think because of the movies, he had such a reach. He was able to inspire so many different people 
with that platform. I mean, I knew nothing <clears throat> about it. And then I started the classes with you and it kicks your ass. <laughs> like, so you didn't know anything about martial arts? Nothing. I knew so, nothing about it. I kind of just correlated it with karate. Right. And that's it. And I didn't know anything really about karate except for like the stereotypes or you see it in a movie or in a TV show. So why did you come to class? Chris. Well, I mean, <laughs> I think most people talk about going to class like that. So I compared it to like Orange Theory, hit classes. And like, I think a lot, the big misconception is like you actually get in shape doing your classes, right? Yeah, I can. So it's like high intensity. It's, um, it's, it's using every muscle in your legs. Trust I, me, it hurts. I don't know how you wouldn't get in shape <laughs> doing your classes. That's it's so interesting. Well, so um, Chris came to me and said, "I want to do something for my group. I think it'd be a nice team building." And I think what the I said, "Well, what are the goals?" You know, because everybody has different goals. And his he said his goals primarily were more of a fitness component, and then to add some spice to keep the interest, let's let's add in some self defense or self protection. I said, "Got it." And when you guys came to me as a group, I if you if you remember, I continuously asked you, I was like, how are we are we on are we on pace to meeting your goals? Are we having fun? Are we doing the same things? Because my goal is to get you back to the next class. And if you're not having fun, you probably won't come back to the next class. Mm -hmm. If you're not seeing results, you may not come back to the next class. So for a good instructor, he's gotta he's gotta make sure you have fun, mm -hmm. you get value out of the class uh, and and learn something. And that's for me, like something you can remember how to do. Mm -hmm. So when you think of martial arts, like how you get, I've done so many um, like free trial self defenses at like FSU, the police force. They would come in and show you little tricks oh, here wow. and there, but they never stuck. Like you never truly remembered how to, in a high stress situation, oh, I'm going to do this finger move and I'm going to put their wrist backwards. Right. Like you, you never really left the class being like, oh, yeah, if someone on the street came up to me, even right after learning it. But then with your classes, like I just felt stronger. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I could do it. Like now I feel like I could do it. So those classes, when you learned those, when you did those classes, did you feel like you were, you could apply those techniques afterwards, immediately afterwards? Yes. You did. Yes. Okay. Like you? I felt, and I never had to, nobody ever just came checking. and tried to attack me, but if I needed to, like I could, because we learned so many different ones and uh -huh. they were more, I guess they came naturally like the body movements and the, like, what's the word? Hmm. I wish I knew you back then because I would have tried it and see how well you well, we kept actually saying, retained that practice. We kept saying, Anthony's going to come up to us in the parking lot after. <laughs> oh, no, I was us. talking about the classes you took in college. Oh, no, those ones, I had never retained anything. I was going to say. Okay, that's what I was curious about. So what did, did you do, like hand manipulations or what did, do you remember? I, I wouldn't even remember. Just I learned just, how to scream for help. I just remember they trying to say, like, if a guy at a bar, they kind of come up and just put their arm around you and right. they kind of trap you in like a very casual manner from right. like the outside appearance. No one can tell. But you're stuck with that person. They taught you how to like take their hand and roll it around. And and I never really retained it mm -hmm. because it was a very unnatural kind of motion. OK, but the motions we did, like the flow of it made sense okay okay like so so i'm assuming though when people come to you most people that want self-defense they want it for for the, a specific reason that may have happened in their life right do people usually come up to you and say hey i want to learn this because um there was an event that happened or i know something that happened and i want myself or my family or even my children to kind of stay ahead and learn how to protect themselves so that's a great question. When people call me, I think it's super important because a lot of times people will say, listen, I want to do this specific martial art. And I'll say, terrific. I can help with that. Can you tell me specifically what your goals are? And then I'll try to investigate if anything happened, just like you said, in their, in their recent future or a recent uh, memory or to them or to a friend. And sometimes that does happen where there's some sort of trauma and we need to address that. So I, I had a woman recently, she did a bunch of one-on-ones or private classes with me, and she had a, a little bit of a trauma with somebody grabbing her. So we started a self-defense program with her and it was, it, was, it was challenging in the beginning because anybody that resembled or did any sort of motion that resembled her experiences would mm. trigger her and she would get upset. So you have to stair step 
stair-step the program to get to a point where she could actually use real techniques to protect herself. Wow. So that is, so literally when people come to you, it, it could be a broad reason why they're coming, just to get in shape, mm-hmm. trauma in their past, or, 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 or the world's getting crazy, I want to learn, stay ahead of the game type thing. Absolutely. So with adults, so at Martial Arts Advantage, we work with all age groups from three years old. And I just recently had um, a great grandmother. I think she's a great, great grandmother. She's, she just recently um, stopped training. She was 80, she's 83 years old, I believe, 83 mm. years old. Um, she, she's tremendous. We called her Kung Fu Nana. I was so, about to say, don't they call her Kung Fu Nana? Yeah, you heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> so with adults, generally speaking, adults come to our program either for one fitness component. So they want something fun to do. So they could be have a fitness component, maybe some social aspects mm-hmm. or and they want some sort of self-protection, self-defense. They want to they want to be able to walk down the street, walk in a room and feel comfortable and confident. And I feel like nowadays nobody really does, especially if you're in somewhere where like there's a lot of people, Mm -hmm. people get a little antsy just because of everything that's been happening with like guns and shootings. Yeah. So I remember distinctly we were in one of your classes and we were like, how how do you even start the topic of it? Like you went and you traveled and you taught teachers. Oh, yes. So would you use each room? differently like how would you approach this room if someone came into the room with a gun or did you do more of like anywhere you were so like situational or scenario training yeah basically yeah oh that's interesting okay so um a little bit of jumping topics but that's as far as firearms we did a i work with a security group it's called draco security group and i've traveled overseas with this uh, with this group and we've done some things nationally, this private school hired us on to help with their teachers. We had 150 school teachers, and they wanted to know about, um, in your case, in this case, the specific stories, the act of shooting and what to do. And it's, how do you broach that subject? What do you, what do you do when somebody comes in to a building and you start talking about potentials? What could potentially happen? Where, you know, where would they enter? So you start talking about security from a perimeter standpoint, from an externally, you know, are, are we doing enough to make it challenging, make it make it a hard target for your facility? Are you do you have cameras? Do you have bushes in places where it makes it more challenging, where it creates a, a, a division of property? So you, people know that if you if you cross this threshold, oh, there, you're, there's there's an alarm there. There's a cause for concern. What's going on? What how is your do you have a, a person walking up and down to security? I mean, in any School from kindergarten to college, there was never really any security. Yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's a. But dip- nowadays, I think it's changing. I don't know. Like, we never even had gates. Like, I mean, we had gates, but they were open. You could just open it right up. We never had cameras. Like, I came from a very small town, so mm-hmm. there was no budget for security. You know, something I've noticed in this, in this uh, society, a lot of times it's something strange or weird happens a lot of times we t- we tend to look the other direction we try we tend to look the other way and i believe that is a major component of first defense first line of defense is is having everyone have the the know-how or the courage to walk up to somebody saying hey how can i help you what's what's happening here you know just just be friendly and approach somebody and if anything out of the ordinary extends from that then you can alert somebody Mm-hmm. But a lot of times you see somebody strange, you go, well, that's none of my business. I'm going to walk the other direction. And I think in other cultures, for example, in Israel, they, they are trained that way. If something strange or weird happens, they're trained to confront the person. You don't do it in a malicious or a violent way. You just walk up to them and say, hey, how are you? My name is. And how can I help you? Do you need directions? Just start a conversation with somebody. Get Have the confidence to do that. And I think, again, martial arts with that sort of training will help you have the courage and the know-how to do that. Mm-hmm. Give, and maybe just give you a script. Do this. So it brings situational awareness and in people because, you know, I remember when I came to you, it's like, you know, I said, hey, you go into a movie theater, you go into a restaurant. Like, I know I've, I've known some FBI agents or CIA, and they're mm-hmm. like, anytime you walk into a building, no matter what it may be, they know mm-hmm. where all the exit signs are. They know where all the, you know, they look at it. You know, that's it's like they process it and, and if – 
what an active shooter were to come in. Mm-hmm. They'll know where where to you know get people out or or how to escape, uh, you know, a situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, right now in this room, are you like, where are my exits? <laughs> So that's interesting. Um, if you start paying attention, and some people think if you start talking that way, they think, oh, this guy's a little bit wacko. Yeah. A little paranoid. A little weird. <laughs> Schizophrenic, a little bit. Paranoia. <laughs> you can you can do it in a manner where it's very nonchalant. Just yeah. walk in and say, okay, there's that car up there. There's a truck out, in the, by the way, in the front of the parking lot. There's a, tags are expired. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Oh, they are? Yeah. Oh. 1221. And then huh. you look for the front door, you look for the exit, you come in, you see the different doors, you see the personnel there. How are they acting? Are they acting? Are they smiling? Are they are they friendly? You know, you look for, maybe you look for the restrooms because I need to go to the restroom sometimes. I know. You I was know. like, did you go to the bathroom just to see? <laughs> just to check things out. I looked in a couple offices. So it's, <laughs> like, it's like psychology. It's like you're learning behavior of people wherever you go. Yeah. You just, just get a lay of the land. I, I had my um, nephews going to sound super strange. I don't really tell a lot of people this, but maybe Mm -hmm. I do. But we would be, whether we go to church or whatnot, or a restaurant um, or another facility, I say, okay, do you you guys remember where the exits are? And they go, yes, there's that exit over there. I said, okay. And what if if you're walking and you need to hide somewhere? What is concealment? What is cover? Do you all know the difference between concealment and cover? No. No. I mean... Cover meaning you probably cover on your hide on your table and you conceal. You're probably in a an you're area trapped. where you're like a closet or something. Yeah. So concealment, I would say, if you had a bed sheet, you could conceal. You can't see me. I'm hiding behind a bed sheet. Yeah. But that wouldn't necessar- necessarily be cover. And we're talking in regards to potential firearms. Mm. Can you can a fire can a firearm go through that sheet? The answer is yes. So what would cover be? Maybe a a wall. A, yeah, maybe uh, an exterior wall. Say interior walls, a lot of times they're just paper. It's like drywall. Mm-hmm. Maybe behind a, a dumpster, a steel dumpster. Maybe behind the engine block of a car. That would be cover. Mm. Things like that. So just if, you just if you just make that part of your everyday travels, it's just, it's, it becomes just part of what you do. Like I like brushing your teeth. Like, oh, there's the exit. Oh, there's the restroom. I guess I need to get restroom. My mom oh. all the times, every time, every facility she goes to, like, where's the restroom? Where's the restroom? Because she likes knowing where the restroom is. Wow. wow. So it is living a little paranoid, but in a good way. Paranoid or just just educated about your environment. That's true. There's a different way of looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I guess if people take it to a different level, then then it makes a big difference. Obviously. Yeah. If you're acting strange all the time, and maybe other people can notice that you're uncomfortable or they're uncomfortable around you, then I think it becomes, yeah, then it becomes- A little obsessive. Obsessive. So (laughs) talking in all this and and talking about like, you know, shooters and everything else, obviously Mm -hmm. there's a uh, epidemic in in the United States of recent school shootings with the Vegas shooting as well. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a serious terrorist attack that happened, what, a few years ago? And then even hospital shootings, uh, you know, there seems to be an uptick in mass shootings uh, of of people who just go into a public area. There's that Walmart, even an employee who's mad at other uh, people who who work at Walmart, and and he ended up shooting several people as well. Yeah. There was a shooting at FSU in the library, and it's surprising because I went there maybe two years after it happened. You would not know because there's no— any improvement in no security. Changes. Yeah. <laughs> There's no changes. And so it's like, is, is it because it doesn't really help or they don't have the funds for it? Yeah. I, I think, you know, I think a lot of it's for someone to pull a firearm and to shoot somebody else or mass shootings, I think they need help somehow. Um, mm-hmm. you, Doc, you could probably speak on this as far as mental illness. They're, they're just not right in the head. It's not. No. And nobody is... That's not a, even a crime of passion. That's you're insane at that point. I, I think I think you know they they need someone to talk to a mm-hmm. lot of times, and a lot of times in this in this country, uh, especially men, they're not uh, they're almost not given permission to talk about their feelings or talk mm-hmm. about the pain they may mm-hmm. be enduring. Maybe they're enduring a lot of stress, and much like what I talked about, if you see something strange or weird, talk to that person. Right. It, it could extend to the same way. If you see somebody acting strange or maybe they're isolated a lot of times, what is happening? I, I've, I've had um, personal training clients 
where they've told me they feel very uncomfortable in public in public spaces. Um, I've had relatives also say the same thing. They just they feel uncomfortable in groups. So I think they need someone or an outlet to talk talk mm-hmm. to or talk with. To I think that's a start. So you that. think it's a it's a culture like because this didn't happen. If you look back, what thirty years ago mm-hmm. or however many years ago, yeah. Yeah. obviously it's exponentially grown the number of incidences that occur mm-hmm. with mass shootings mm-hmm. or whether it be mass or just going in and murder suicides, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. But clearly there's some trigger or there's something that happened. You know, does that mean there was an increase in mental health disorder? Does it, you know, is it because accessibility has changed? There's obviously not going to politics, but the, you know, the legal um, component of it that allows people and maybe there's not enough checks and balances in the system that, mm-hmm. you know, people are able to get away with. Um, I mean, have you, because obviously you've been doing this for many years, have you, what, what's your opinion just as why someone would say the number of, of shootings have gone up and, and it's become a problem, you know, in this country, because some argument is it doesn't happen in other countries as much, mm-hmm. but it happens here more. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, I don't know if anyone really has a correct answer for that or if there is one. That's tricky, isn't it? Because, um, especially the environment we live in today, it becomes extremely political. Am I on this side or am I on that side? And I think what what happens is we get at a standstill and, and, and nothing's getting done. Um, one side will say that we need more uh, laws and more legislation, more rules. We need mm-hmm. uh, more bans. Another side will say, well, we need more freedom. Um, I guess the argument can also go with, this, is, this isn't the same, I guess, same thing, but like, like nowadays... Uh, marijuana is is like is always argued there should be more limitations on those sort of drugs and, and whatnot. And what other sides have known it needs to be completely legalized. Mm-hmm. And here we are today. We're, we're seeing we're seeing the uh, ramifications of what's happening. And it seems like it's 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 working. I suppose. I mean, I'm not an expert on that part, that part either. Um, I do think with the media and what's happening, I think what's being more publicized is the mass shootings just the the bad news you know because that's i guess that's what sells Mm -hmm. and the good news isn't and from what i've seen the good news isn't necessarily talked about so much for example law-abiding citizens with firearms protecting Uh, you don't hear about that a lot then you hear that you hear not at all really but then when you do hear about it it's kind of portrayed like you never hear about this Mm-hmm. It's it's it already has the negative that right. you don't hear about it. Yeah, I don't I don't think that sells as well as uh it's you know somebody or maybe it doesn't uh fit the narrative as far as mm-hmm. this this law abiding person with a firearm was able to thwart something. I I personally feel like the more and more that they capitalize on the mass shootings and how they portray it in the media, it's only gonna induce a copycat or another troubled kid or another Mm -hmm. troubled Mm -hmm. human Mm -hmm. that he's like oh they did it Uh, now i'm gonna do it Mm -hmm. like so now i'm like can we just stop (laughs) putting it out there like it's horrible enough to to see it happen we don't need to see it constantly on repeat broadcasted and that's just my opinion that it could be yeah katie i think that's a great argument i think a lot of people um Again, back with the mental illness, they're just not in the right state of mind. They start seeing all the attention given to this mm-hmm. person or group. So it, it maybe it does lead to something like like what you said. Well, I read some articles. Obviously, you know, being in healthcare, we've we you know, so we get emails sent out for another hospital shooting or mm. a patient who got upset with his orthopedic surgeon because after surgery his pain got worse, never got better. Right. Went to his office and shot the surgeon in, oh, his, wow. in his office. Yeah. So you see a lot of I, – I personally, as a physician, have been threatened by uh, family members. Like, said, if you don't fix my loved one, I'm going to yeah. go home, get a gun, and I'm going to yeah. come back, and I'm going to kill you. Yeah. I'm going to kill your family I mean, or people around. I mean, right? So, yeah. I've been threatened more times. I can even count. And and it's it's – I guess – in, in that arena, it's a little bit difficult because you understand people are sick, and I think people's emotions are at the highest when their loved ones They're are sick. They're under so much duress and stress. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you're so, not even thinking right. But yeah. nobody does any of these insane crimes thinking straight. I don't think so. 
it, so is it like a crime of passion? You know, it ends up being like just uh, all, all their emotions, all these external forces that come in, and and you know they 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 don't think straight, they don't see straight, and and this is what yeah you know the yeah. resolution is they see red. Yeah, it's, well, there's there's guys out there that do a lot of research and statistical analysis. Right. Um, there's a guy on YouTube that I I think he, he's an attorney. His name's Colin uh, Colion Norar. He's an attorney. He's extremely articulate. He's a big proponent of the Second Amendment, and he seems to be able to articulate. I feel like, but he's very biased, obviously, to one side. But he seems to articulate one of the perspectives that is not being um, articulated with the other side. So he he's a good person. He does a lot of statistical analysis, and and if a media comes out with something, he he analyzes it and says, "Well, they're saying this because of this, but it's it's not the whole picture." Mm-hmm. So I think that's super important to get with somebody who's actually done that type of research. Yeah, yeah. mass shootings, suicides, whatnot. I mean, I know just that at one of our local hospitals, they just started weapons screening just because they've had some issues with guns in the hospital. And from working there and just knowing nurses, like it is so easy to bring things in and out of that. It's so easy. Are they bringing, what are they doing? Metal detectors, x-ray machines? I'm thinking just x-ray and metal detectors. It's metal metal um, detectors, but I think there's also, uh, it's almost like the airport security where it just... Um, it's yeah. a little bit more specific to, to weapons, yeah. I but believe. You know what's even scarier is it's still very limited screening, and it's only to visitors, and it's not with the employees. Oh, there you go. And everyone's a target in my book right. because now I'm I'm almost that paranoid person when I'm in big like airports or hospitals or a just couple. really big crowds. I'm always like, it could happen. Well, you brought a good point because it's not just the family or the patients. I think two or three years ago in New York, there was this resident doctor mm-hmm. – um, I, I, he was from, um, I forget where he was from, but it, when, when you're a residency, you train with, you know, your colleagues, other physicians, and he came in one day and he had a rifle. Somehow he brought it in. Mm. Uh, no one knows how. Well, it really went, isn't that hard. Like, right. <laughs> but a rifle is, you know, I would think at least that they could be able to, but anyways, he brought it in and you he can went, conceal anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He went floor by floor through staircases, knew all the exits, knew everything where people will hide and just started shooting. There's an employee? He was a physician. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was a, uh, a medical doctor, a resident in training. So um, you I, know, when Katie brought up that point, it, it's not just obviously patients and family, but it could be, you know, doctors, nurses, uh, environmental, you know, like uh, whoever. It, if anyone's going through stress, they say it all the time, how everyone, nurses, doctors are so burnt out. Like it's constantly said, but still, I think it's a little scary that like us ourselves are not being screened. Overworked. Coming tired. into your most stressful environment and mm-hmm. people who are just dreading yeah. being there. I can't yeah. imagine the stress. So, you know, what's interesting is we um, talk about that awareness. If you see something strange or weird and then walk up to that person. Say you're talking to a facility. That same thing can happen with a colleague. You can Mm -hmm. say, hey, listen, you seem like you're going through a lot and talk to them, talk Mm -hmm. to them. And then from an, we we could debate or talk about the different talking points as as far as uh, legislating what we do with laws and whatnot. But I think from an individual standpoint, just being more aware, open your eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm walk when I walk, generally, I, I generally watch and I try to see if I see any sort of, they call it imprinting, where you maybe see a firearm poking out of somebody's clothing. Mm-hmm. So you just look for that and you smile. Hey, how are you? And you just, you just do a glance. I look and see where people's hands are, you know, do they, and this is very obvious, but if they ball their hands up in a fist, like, oh, that's interesting. Like, why are you so stressed that your hands you know, are like, why are they there? Clenching. Are you plan on doing yeah. something, you mm-hmm. know, I just watch people's body posture, watch, watch, their, just watch all the telltale cues, all the nonverbal communication. It's interesting you say that. I'm thinking because you look at, no matter what work environment you're in, mm-hmm. and let's say I know someone just through work purposes and you see them like what on a weekly basis and, you know, you can see various ranges of emotions during work for sure. people, right? Sure. They're stressed out or they come in happy. and But when you actually, like, I mean, it's just hard for me to imagine in a workplace because we know people get stressed because they may have come out of a patient's room and had a difficult conversation mm. and they may do a 180 and then they may completely change. So I happen to walk through that 
hallway where that person's walking and, and their demeanor completely changed, my impression would be they must have had a difficult encounter or something must have happened. Yes. But yet it's so hard to really register or, or, or try to, you know, figure out, is there something a little bit more uh, to it than just that? Yeah. So that's that's part of it, too. You talked about the psychology of it. Um, have we learned how to talk to people? Have we learned how to communicate with them? Right. I mean, it's, th- there's a certain book now that talks about coaching athletes. They call it a uh, motivational interview. It's coaching athletes to be their best, I believe the book is called. And it's super interesting. Um, my background's in psychology and behaviorism, so I try. I tend to gravitate and listen and try to watch for behavioral cues. Mm-hmm. Um, this particular book talks about how to talk to somebody, and in this case, athletes, but it could be colleagues as well, because instead of being the fixer, if somebody has something wrong, I've, I've heard people say, L- "Listen, suck it up. You're great. No, rub some dirt on it. You're going to yeah. be fine." Mm-hmm. But maybe that's not the best answer. Yeah. They, maybe they need to really express themselves. I mean, everyone's an individual, so everyone takes things completely different. I agree. And that's why when in nursing school, you're given a book and you're given a set of questions and answers of like, what's the correct response to this patient's statement? Yeah. Or And there isn't one. But in school, you have to say, oh, yep, that's the most yeah, correct. With the different personalities, are we trained to be able to have conversations with people? How social are we? And now with, with uh, social media and whatnot, I think this society is getting less and less versed with being able to have uh, in one-on-one. person yes. conversations. In, in person conversations. Um, I've got a staff, some team, they would much rather text you than call you. Mm-hmm. Right. But as opposed, and then, man, I got to see you in person. And they're, they're actually instructors they're on the mat. They're great. But actually having one-on-one conversations, I think they prefer to text, mm-hmm. you know, whatnot. And I, I think that's, that's strange to me. And it adds I, I, another dimension. It's another dimension. I, yeah. I want to hear all the, I want to get on the phone with you. I want to talk to you. I want to hear the inflections. I want to hear the speed. I'm a phone call person too. I hate the text. You come from that generation. I do. So it's surprising, like just dealing with different people in my own generation. And they are, they only want to text. And I'm like, well, I have no idea the tone that you're sending this in. Is it a male, female thing? Is that, do you think? I don't Is know. A more individual person? I think it's more individual because I call, I feel like I've had so many girlfriends where I call them and they're annoyed that I'm calling them. Oh, really? Okay. And I'm like, well, I just want to say hi. I want to hear from, your voice. Do you come from a big family where it's super social that way or? Uh, dad's background? side, very social. Mom's side, social, but it seems like we text more, which is surprising. On your mom's side? On my mom's side. And they live further, so you would expect the calling to be more of the options your mom text my mom we do everything we do it all okay but then my dad hates calling well won't even say like love you bye on the phone like that's weird to him to do it on the phone (laughs) what oh he has to do it in person he likes doing it in person yeah it's weird to do it over the phone yeah so to circle back it it would i would say we need to be better at human interactions that way Mm -hmm. from from a personal standpoint being able to protect we need to be better at recognizing all the cues now, if it's a self-defense situation, when I, when you walk down the street, are you watching? Like my wife, she's in charge of our family. <laughs> That's and, always right. Yeah, yeah. They say she wears the pants, and it's and it's just there's then, n- there's no secret to that. Yeah, she, I didn't yeah. want to say it, but it sounds like she wears the pants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if that's an inappropriate thing to say, but that's <laughs> I guess that's the cliche. Um, so she's in charge, except for when I turn on, and then she's like, oh, and she understands. We have we have an understanding. Um, we were in South Africa and uh, visiting and, um, I, she could tell when I turn on and she, I, I was like, okay, follow me, move. Or, and I, a lot of times are very nonverbal. I'll touch her on the shoulder or I'll direct her kind of like, uh, have you ever done any dance instruction, salsa mm-hmm. or yeah. waltz? Like someone takes the lead. Someone takes the lead. Right. Mm-hmm. So I know how to move the hips, move the shoulder, guide the hand gingerly, gently. And it flows. And it flows. So it's like a dance. So I knew to dance her into a more public area because you were store. flagged. You kind of had a red flag. I had popping an alert. Up. I had a few gentlemen walking towards us, and um, I wasn't very comfortable. Some some people would call it your intuition, mm-hmm. some awareness. Um, so I just I just guided her into another store. She knew because we have this understanding. You need to role play that with your family, with your kids. If something happens, and you can say you can make a game out of certain things, so you don't alarm anybody. You don't become this. I'm a paranoid guy. Let's, let's, you know, right. hey kids, let's play a game. When I say uh, Disney, we're going to see who can duck down and hide over here and do this. Like, oh, that was so good. You're so good at hiding 
And when I, you know, so things like that, there's, yeah. there's a lot of things you can talk about, but my wife knows when I guide her certain places, she moves. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's really cool. I mean, I would feel so safe. That'd almost be a class for your traveling. How do you, you know, go to certain areas that may be dangerous that you don't know what you're, you're going with family yeah. and, and how do you get everyone so that you guys are on the same page? Just, just be aware of where you're going with your environment. Um, some people are just so in the, in unicorn land, they're naive. And then you would say, oh, I don't want to live in this paranoid land. Like everything's bad. It's, it's just an education. Mm -hmm. So if you go to certain countries, understand the customs, understand, because you may do something that may offend somebody being in, in this culture. So do understand the culture, understand the tendencies and understand what can happen. Um, and then, and watch for cues, you know, mm -hmm. stay, stay in areas where you think are safe. I mean, for, so they do uh, CDI training. I think it's like certified defense, something with nurses that okay. we, they make us take the course at the hospital I had just worked at uh -huh. and very short course. And it was honestly laughable. Like the whole time, it just wasn't realistic. It wasn't very like scenario based. They, right. you just have to, cause as a nurse, like there's only so much that protects you until like you're at fault for the patient's injuries. Oh, right. Liability. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of liability that goes along with it. So if like a patient's coming towards you, the only thing they tell you to do is to yell, stop, stand back. Yeah. But your hands have to be a certain way. So then you're not the attacker. Mm -hmm. You have to be complete defensive mode. Mm -hmm. And I remember learning it and being like, okay, so basically we're getting hurt no matter what, because of the liability on the hospital. Mm -hmm. So everything was like very in a defense, you're in a, in a corner, but they mm -hmm. tried to teach you, well, make sure you're in the right place in the room. If you're a nurse, you know, you have to have, you have to be in a spot in the room. If, if you have to do the IV machine, like yeah. the pump, the pump's over it, there. It you be have very to, vulnerable, right? Exactly. Right. You have to be there. There's a lot of heavy equipment in that room yeah. that a patient could use Yeah, because it's not like if a patient is, so if a patient is like a Baker Act, which means like they're harming themselves or others, the only thing they take out of the room really are like cords, things of that sort mm. that like strangling, like they yeah. think of that, but you can't take a vital machine out of the room that they need, that it's definitely a weapon. A pole is a weapon. Well, what about the person themselves? The person themselves, it's, it's all about the, how humane is it? So just because they're aggressive sometimes doesn't mean they have to be restrained 24 hours a but day. You have to protect the nurses, don't you? And the doctors. And yes. it's, it's tricky though, because it's very you, tricky. You don't know a patient in the hospital of who Katie may take care of and it may be my patient, they may wake up confused. Oh yeah. A lot of people who are confused, especially different age groups, are they're withdrawing from a drug or they're mm. on other types of medications so may, many may trigger off aggressive measures. Right. So many variables. And it may not wow. be because it's them. It may be because there's delirium, there's there's medications that's kickstarting how they feel, how they're acting and right. they're confused. Just like an animal who's confused will do mm -hmm. anything they can to defend themselves. But that confusion translates to aggressiveness to a nurse or physician or medical staff. So, And there may not be intent, you're saying. Correct. They just, they just yeah. react that right. way. So if you're thinking about it, I mean, we always bring up this, like, Kung Fu Nana. Uh -huh. There are some Kung Fu Nanas at the hospital okay. that, you know, the delirium, dementia, sundowning, like the, as the sun goes down, the more confused oh, they get. right. So if you're at shift report, say you're a, a day nurse or a night nurse, the day nurse is like, oh, this is Nana. Uh -huh. She's the sweetest little lady you've ever seen. Sundown happens. Hit eight o'clock. Kung Fu Nana comes out to she play. She some ass. Oh, wow. And she's going to beat your ass if you're trying to give her some medications. Yeah. And if it's the family and they're walking in, like you don't, you want to make it as humane as possible. Obviously she's 85 years old. How much damage could really be done, mm -hmm. but safety of her too, if she's lunging and she falls or, so you really don't want to make it inhumane and put a vest restraint, a wrist restraint, ankle restraints. Like that's a lot. Inhumane. Maybe it angers them even more. Exactly. It could, it could get them a little bit more riled up. I have a question with the course you took CDI. Mm -hmm, that's what it was called. So they, they taught you to say back. They literally stop. said, yell, stop, stand back or stay back okay. and put your hands up as yeah. if you are like. Like a shield? Yes. Like so you, yes, yeah, so if you open your palm and face it outwards, it's a universal sign to stop, back off. Back off. So. Um, but that's it. That's all we get. Are you, are you trying to <laughs> alert like other people to come help you? Yes. Like screaming, stop, stand back. And that's... the other people, if they come in the room, what happens? 
it's, they help. They, they assist. They help, right? but you really you you How can do they assist though? Well, in the safest way possible that protects this, the hospital. My, that, that's my question. What is the safest way possible? Well, verbally trying to de-escalate the situation, and then if it's coming to the point where they're becoming aggressive, then we use uh, soft restraints, or we call chemical restraints, where we give medication to help calm them down. In addition, they call what's called maybe a code gray overhead, mm-hmm. which brings security over. Mm-hmm. They That's bring in people, and probably. they come in uh, teams mm-hmm. where they assist in, in making sure that the physical aggressiveness is not there towards the staff or each other. Yeah. And, and hopefully You're saying that, talking somebody down, but this is somebody maybe on drugs you said or not right in the mind. Yeah. I mean, you still have to verbally try to, you know— talk them down by de-escalating the situation yeah. as much as you can. You yeah. have to. Well, and then, you know, look, if I'm, uh, I mean, if, if Katie's acting as aggressor to me, I mean, what's our first human response is to try to talk it down, right? I mean, that's the first For thing sure. you have to always For do. For sure, verbal. Yep. So knowing that even if they're on medications or anything else, it's not really them. But, you know, I think a lot of times we're able to accomplish the goal of trying to Bring them down, calm them down. Certain right. maybe verbal cues, you know, maybe oh your your husband's coming. Yeah. In the next thirty minutes, he wanted to make sure you're okay, but he's on his way. And then but, oh he is like all of a sudden they kind of snap. They calm you down. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Calm yeah you, down. you jilt them out of that that yeah. mindset. Like, yeah. Oh your husband's coming. Oh did you see this picture of what? Yeah. Like, and I gotta say nurses are amazing at doing that because they're just I think almost every other patient mm-hmm. they have they have situations where that happens. Like, you know? I got a story about jilting somebody. I want to I want to say though. Um, <clears throat> the goal is to protect you, yourself, your staff, your team, and that the patient as well. Keep everybody safe. Do they talk about how to stand? Do they talk about the angle of standing? Do you stand facing them? Do they, they did. Do they talk about your hands go here when you're saying hi to somebody? But the, it's it's got twofold applications. And um, if they go to reach for you, like grab your hair. Oh, I've your... been assaulted in so many ways. And it's really what they train it's impossible because what you do is so close to the patient, so hands on to the patient. Mm-hmm. Like I'm always an inch from them because mm-hmm. you have to be here if I'm cleaning them or doing a wound care. Well, not only that, you have needles that you oh, wow. you are also yeah. trying to maybe draw blood yeah. or, or put an IV yeah. and and they're being aggressive. Yeah. So then there's the safety of blood. Oh, and, and, wait, and, 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 let's and, just throw the COVID testing into play. I, I mean, we've oh, that had... Hurt. I'm aggressive when they try to COVID test me too. But think of me <laughs> doing it to a schizophrenic patient mm-hmm. and I had to do his, their COVID test. Yeah. And it's like, I preemptively, I called security because I was like, no way this man doesn't even like trust the cereal. Why, why wouldn't that be protocol having another body in there and helping? So at this hospital in particular, they do video monitoring. So as long as they're on video, it's safe. Wow, that's strange. Safe. To, I mean, if you if you really think about that, how how well it how, becomes a staffing issue too, right? Yeah, you can't I always can it. if it happens somewhat frequently, you can't always dedicate another staff member no, I who's get attending it. to. I'm just and if if we had all of our drivers, everything we wanted, you would want somebody else there because things can go bad very very fast. Oh, I called them before I even even yeah. tried because the patient was known. To right. be like this. So from a self-defense standpoint, there are ways to stand so you mitigate risks, so you mitigate things. There are ways, like I feel very comfortable. I could stand next to somebody and you control the hand, the palms, the elbows, and you control what they can do with their, their bite. If they if People don't think about that. Oh, no, I've, I've been okay. attempted bitten. Okay. I was never actually bitten. So there's different ways to uh, uh, redirect. Um, they could bite you. They could headbutt you. They could grab th- at things. And there's different ways of standing and different ways to redirect somebody mm-hmm. without harming them or without harming your partner. There's different uh, self-defense techniques you can do. I think that would be super important. I think they really need to be trained way more. It was one class. It yeah. was maybe two hours long. But and check it- this out. Imagine you have a team um, and they have the confidence like, oh, gosh, if I just put my hand here, if I stand this way, I have this overwhelming confidence. I'm able to keep everyone safe, including myself. Now, how, what's my posture going to be like? What's my? I'm going to be kinder. I'm going to be nicer because I'm not going to be in fear of myself or my job or of the patient. I'm going to be. I'm going to be so much more confident if I have that e- extra training 
Because I was scared going into a lot of patients' rooms yeah. because I knew what was going to happen. I'd had them before in the past. and yeah. I almost feel like they should do an educational video like what you're saying and, and make it like a protocol during orientation, right, for wherever people work or what they do and, yeah. and how to handle these type of yeah. situations. Yeah. Well, so, Katie, my question to you is like you, you've you done uh, probably, what, three or four months of training with me? I did, yes. And, um, once a week. Wasn't mm-hmm. wasn't extensive, but it was once a week. Mostly a fitness component to it. Mm-hmm. And we added the self-defense. Um, did you feel more confident doing those classes? Oh, yes. For sure. Well, good. For sure. Just even the way of, like, you put your hand, like, what or where even on the face are you going to cause the most damage? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm understanding, like, obviously, as in a nurse patient role, I can't look at how much damage am I going to do to this mm-hmm. patient because mm-hmm. that would be not... We would, I would get sued, but it's helpful to know if like it was life or death, or if I did think that my life was in danger, I would go for that. So you, you have a better knowledge base. You have more comfort, more confidence in doing that. And in the training you felt, was it safe? Yes. You felt very safe. Yeah. Did, see people, Chris, um, people talk to me. You, I think you talk to me when people start talking about doing martial arts and mm-hmm. whatnot, they, they, they tend to think, ah, uh, you know, that martial arts, some people say it's for kids. Right? Is it for kids? It's not really for what I'm trying to do. Um, it, it it can't, or it's or it's dangerous, or I'm going to get hurt. I had such a bias on it. What did like, you What did you like, think before I started? I was like, What is this even going to be? Karate kid, Cobra like, Kai. Am I gonna? Yeah, like, am I gonna have to break up like a like a piece of wood? Yeah. Like, I'm like, yeah. this isn't like that's not helpful in your actual life, but yeah. it is so helpful. Well, you know, okay, so I would agree with you. The, our, the way we work and stigma. the way we teach. Um, however, there's a stigma. And there are a lot of times there are stigmas for mm-hmm. reasons. There are stereotypes for reasons. Mm-hmm. And I do think with the martial arts industry, there's reasons. People go, ah. But then you see these kickboxing classes and how they're kind of marketed and girls go crazy well, for I them. I got to tell you this, though. I mean, I've done training with you, what, almost two years, three years now? Yeah, close I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think close to three years I mean, I, I came to you. I said, listen, I want to be a walking weapon <laughs> is what I said, right? Yeah, you yeah. know, and then you like like John Wick. I'm like, never saw the movie, but sure, 100%. Yeah. I know about it. But I got to tell you the confidence level. But, I mean, you see my body changed from like three years ago to, to where we are now and the strength I have with the kicks and oh, self-defense and punching and everything else. Yeah. Like, you know, we... I said, listen, I'm not all about breaking boards, but I want to do it just to try it. I thought it was really cool when we were able to yeah. do it. I was like, this is really cool. Yeah, there's a stigma, but that's not what it is. It's like it helped your mind. It helped your physical body. Mm-hmm. It helped, mm-hmm. you know, emotionally, you know, like if someone has a temper, you know, I said, hey, I could be in a situation where I need to protect, you know, uh, you know, if, if something sets me off. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to, like have an aggressive type behavior Mm -hmm. i want to learn how to control things i want to learn how to do this and Mm -hmm. you know you're a very like yeah you're like the perfect specimen to come into this and and do this training and and um and reap the benefits of it i said i could help you yeah so there's my goal was to keep you interested again i think we talked before the podcast started Mm -hmm. uh I've never been clinically diagnosed with ADHD, but I'm quite certain my attention oh, spans all over the place. You two are killing me. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, so. You two are killing me. How about that? All three of us. <laughs> so with uh, with Chris, it was super important to keep you interested and yeah. keep you interested and and continue with the value. Are you, are you are you reaping benefits out of this? And our training has morphed quite a bit, wouldn't you say? It's, it's yeah. morphed oh. according to what our goals are and our goals change. Yeah. You know, this week, our goal is this. This week, it's, it's that. I think just recently we started talking about more firearms. Yeah. Started understanding. And my take on firearms, it's super important. You know, when I got in, involved in firearms, um, gosh, super crazy, silly, getting my concealed permit probably 20 plus years ago and then doing my first firearms training course, it was, it's laughable. And it was literally, this is a gun. Actually, they didn't say the word gun. They said, here, Weapon. do this, go. That was my training. I go, what? And, and, imagine. and I, I, the only reason I wanted to do uh, firearms training at that time is I had a, a martial arts instructor. Um, he's out in Arkansas, Danny Dring. And he came to me and, and uh, he was teaching, uh, I think, a jiu-jitsu class probably 20 plus years ago. Um, and I, I did a lot of kids camps and whatnot. And he, he asked me about guns. And I was like, ah, oh, no, I don't. I don't, I don't touch guns. I don't, there's no, you do everything else. <laughs> why, why would you touch a gun? They're, they're crazy. It's deadly. It's dangerous. And he, he struck a chord with me 
he, he uh, attacked my ego, he, not deliberately. He was right. just, just matter of fact. Yeah. He said, listen, if, um, if you don't understand firearms, you're not a complete martial artist. Wow. And I was like, oh, that's in the yeah. heart. Yeah. Oh, I look at my hard. father's military. I've trained all <laughs> over the place. I've done, you know, I've done so many. I've seen a lot of mm -hmm. martial arts and techniques. And I, I've got a, this crazy passion for it. I go home now. My wife's like, you're still watching martial arts videos? And so I'm like, yeah, it's just amazing. And so at that point, I said, you know what? I need to at least have an understanding what this firearm is. He said to me, he said, listen, you're at a summer camp. And a couple, six, seven, eight-year-olds... They bring you a gun. What are you going to do? And I was like, well, wh what do you mean? He goes, they find a gun somewhere and they bring it to you. They say, hey, um, I got this gun. You know, Mr. Coons, I got this gun. Like, I was like, uh, I, I'm, I know. Unload I, it. I'm college educated. I, you, yeah. Well, how do you unload it? I knew nothing about firearms. Real? I didn't know what a magazine was. I didn't know where to put the bullets. I didn't know. Safety or whatever. <laughs> Is it on or I, off? I knew nothing. I don't know. So, so I went and I sought help and I said, listen, at the very least, I'm so scared. I went to a gun range with another instructor I had up in Tennessee. And um, my lesson was, here's the gun. All right, go. And then I just I didn't do anything. I was afraid to pick it up. He comes back 10 minutes later. He goes, what are you doing? I go, I don't even know how to put bullets in this thing. What do you, what? And he goes, oh. and he loads it up, puts the bullets in and he goes, okay, go. Yeah. He does it for you. And it's like, yeah. you didn't and learn anything. Left. And I was like, uh. And I, and I just sat there. I just sat there looking at the gun. And then finally I said, you know what? If I'm this scared of this gun, I, I got to do something about this. So I picked the firearm uh -huh. up. I don't know if you've been to a gun range at all. Mm -hmm. So an indoor gun range, generally, if, if, you, if you haven't been to, it looks like a bowling, like bowling lanes, like little lanes. Yes. And there's someone on your left. There's someone on your right. And there's a lot of- A lot of noise. A lot of noise. A lot yeah. of banging. Echoing. Super scary if you've never been. If you've never been. And if you had that limited type of training- so I picked the firearm up and I shot it, and it it had a it's a it's a bullet called a forty five. It's a caliber. It's a pretty substantial kick. And <laughs> this I didn't know how to hold the gun. I didn't know how to. I just knew from growing up. You know, you play guns when you're Man. when I was younger. You pull the the trigger, and I was so scared after that firearm went off. It made the loudest noise, and I, my body was trembling. I almost dropped it the first time I oh, shot, shot a gun. It's scary. Well, no one prepares you like oh there's gonna be a little bit of a kick and mm -hmm. you go of course no like because yeah. i wasn't holding it tight enough because yeah. you don't yeah. you don't yeah. i put the firearm down immediately and went and sat down i said i'm never doing this again and then i sat there for like probably 15 20 minutes and i said you know what i have to do this i gotta do if i'm this i was in this much uh fear so i picked it up i uh, i squinted my eyes and i just 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 squeezed the trigger squeezed the trigger and shot you know three or four or five over times and that was my first firearms lesson. I think everyone should uh, experience something like that, right? I mean, imagine, I don't know, you're being attacked. Somehow you, you have access you get to, the a, gun. to a gun. You get it from that person. Mm -hmm. If you're intimidated by it, you're not going to know what to do. You're going to oh. freeze. You're going to do that. Oh, okay. Like, you know, I want to learn about the gun because I don't want to be intimidated <laughs> by it. I want to learn how to handle it, how to, uh, oh, you know, disarm. I was confused when you said that because you mean as far as understanding the firearm. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I thought you meant they should have the same training I had with my first firearm oh, experience. Right. Oh, no. Well, and maybe people's experience may share exactly the same. You're scared of it and you shoot it and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, like yeah. I, I, I could see that being a natural response. Well, I think you need somebody who, who's got a lot of experience with dealing with the public and dealing right. with different personalities. So Chris, with you, we're, we're working now. We've been doing this the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. All we do is they pick the firearm up and I describe it to you. And then I do what they call a safety check. And I do a very specific safety check. We've done it probably five or six times now. Yeah. Um, it's a very specific safety check. And I learned it from um, the Israelis I with, with a, a group, several Israelis. And it was interesting depending on, uh, it didn't matter which uh, branch they were with, which deployment, you know, th they did a safety check the exact same way. So the protocol I use is what they use. I've done, we'll call them quote unquote safety checks with other cultures. And it's, it's vastly different from person to person, department to department, from department to department. But with Israelis, what I found it's the same protocol over and over and over again. I think that's super important. So what yeah. we're doing now, all we're doing is a safety check. What is a safety check? All I'm doing is, is saying, listen, I'm making sure this firearm is safe. That's all I'm doing. Right. If everybody just had that, 
And then they could have an understanding. Of, you don't have to shoot a gun. You could just have an understanding. Oh, this is how I make the firearms safe. Mm-hmm. Because I was so scared, I had no idea if, if a six or seven or eight year old brought me a gun, I would I wouldn't even know how to unload sh- it. No, anything. I, I look since then. I got it. You know, people are gonna go this wackadoo. He's, he's not gonna be able to train me in firearms. He knows nothing about it. Well, it's been twenty years. It's been longer. Yeah, it's it's been twenty five plus years, and I've and I've had several instructors. And at, at that point, well, at this point in my life, I've done a lot of extensive training, um, working with different military groups as an instructor. Um, here in the States and here and over, overseas with different law enforcement facilities, lots of civilians, and I've done lots of courses that way. So it's, and I think it's important, the the level of training, some of the st- stuff I've done is is a pretty high level, but that only makes my super fundamentals and my basic firearms, that which I work with most civilians with, I'm super confident with it mm-hmm. because I know I could do this much higher level training. It's kind of like the martial arts. If you've done high level martial arts and, and being able to protect yourself, the simple stuff you're able to to do Pretty much, cool. much easier. Yeah, yeah, that's really awesome. So that's I what think we're everyone should do it. We're doing, deep, doing, just learn how to do a safety check with your firearm. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, I think we reached our time on this topic, but um, we are obviously going to have you in to discuss more about... We talked about adults, we talked about some gun handling, mass shooting, but I'm definitely interested in our next topic we're going to have is talking about children and bullying yeah, in schools to. and everything else. And I and I think that's a really important... We jumped right into the guns, didn't we? Yeah, we did. I was like, oh, <laughs> I thought we were going to stair step it and we didn't move right in there. No, I love the gun topics. Okay. We it's it's interesting it. because it's um, not a lot of people know a lot about it. And even the people that do, you, you would imagine, you, know, you and I had this conversation earlier in our training. You would think certain people that you would imagine because of their profession, mm-hmm. they've got extensive training, they're highly knowledgeable, and they're highly competent. Um, I, I have found that that's not necessarily the case. Right. And you've trained law enforcement and, and big people all over the world, so yeah. it's a little scary well, sometimes. Well, if they're getting that. the same training, that's kind of scary too. <laughs> Who's that? Like if they're if all police officers are getting trained the exact same way— that's a bit well. That's that's scary. the that's the interesting thing. I think depending on the department, depending on their commanding officer, they're getting trained differently. And I then w- it's you learn right from the get go. Your partner, right? So then, isn't it the two of them? They do the ride alongs for a really long time. Oh, then they start working. Yeah, it's it's, it's just like sharing bad habits, right? Yeah, it could. Well, it's it's it. We went with a uh, a SWAT group. Um, it was up in Georgia, and we worked training with them. And I remember the our, our our head he was my co he said he said you know he had a bunch of guys coming we, we did a half day training and i was working with a group of swap members i think there was i don't know uh, 20 or 30 guys and um within the first couple hours they were raving about the training so my co gets called over and he goes hey what are you doing and i go what he goes i told you this is supposed to be level one the most basic of basic i said it is i'm teaching them how to hold a gun how to load the firearm, if the firearm becomes inoperable, how to make it operable. He goes, what? That's, that's it? I go, I haven't taught him anything yet. I, they're, they're barely able to take the magazine out of their vest. Wow. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, they're, they're, but by the way, that same group, amazing gentlemen. They are um, so nice and humble and incredible shape, and they, they wanted to learn, so they were so excited. And they hire groups all around the country to bring them in. They've actually had, not to brag about the group I was with, they, they actually brought in a high-profile group to come train them. And then they said after the first uh, uh, two days, they were like, okay, we've shown you everything we can show you. What do you guys want to work on? We have three more days to work. And when I worked with the group, we worked on the most fundamental of fundamental things. Well, I was like, I haven't even touched the surface of anything that we can do yet. Wow. I mean, it's, it's a, obviously, it's a lot. And probably people out there who we think are trained could utilize probably a lot more training to really get it done right. Yeah, the only reason I talk about that is because, again, that that extends the confidence. We can take super simple things like making sure a firearm is safe, yeah. making you confident just to be able to go, okay, that, that gun's safe. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was an amazing topic. I mean, I can, we could talk about guns forever, and I'm sure we'll obviously bring you in for further discussions on, uh, you know, topics that we've talked about because I think there's a lot to expand on on those. 
All right. That'd be my pleasure. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming and looking forward to talking about uh, other topics like, you know, children and bullying and school and how you guys handle that oh, wow. and, 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 and martial arts. Some of my passions. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. It's been great. Yeah, it's been awesome. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.